fare in un negozio di caramelle e vuol dire che non ne puoi mangiare neanche qui. Hello? So, I think we will go ahead and start the next session, which is stochastic thermodynamics and information processing, starting off with Rachel Tufno. So, hello everyone. I hope you have had a good lunch. Um, so, I'm Rachel, and uh, today I will be presenting some aspects of my PhD thesis concerning the role of transcriptional noise in HIV latency exit. So, uh, transcriptional noise has already been introduced by some of you. Uh, it's the heterogeneity uh, in gene expression that we see. Uh, in case of HIV, it uh, results in stochasticity, whereas in Rosophila, it, it leads, it's buffered and it leads to these distinct patterns being formed in, during embryo uh, development. But today I'll be focusing more on HIV. Um, so, um, once the HIV virus is, infects the human immune cells, they integrate into the genome system from wherein they can oh, uh, keep producing new viruses. This is called the active infection or remain latent and uh, uh, do nothing. Now, inhibitors, the class of drugs which make up the antiretroviral therapy, they know how to or what to do with these infected, uh, actively infected cells and how to eliminate them, but they don't really know how to, what to do with the ones that remain silent. And it's, in fact, these silently infected cells that form the latent reservoir in HIV, which is, uh, uh, one of the bottlenecks to a cure, because these uh, latent uh, in, uh, uh, infected cells in the latent reservoir can keep producing viruses very minimally under the detection limit, and um, every now and then they result in a burst of activity which can trigger reactivation, uh, viral reactivation and rebound in patients. Um, now, currently there are two strategies to eliminate these uh, latent or manage these latent reservoir, which is a block and lock and shock and kill. But uh, neither of these strategies are 100% efficient, and that's because of the heterogeneous response of the infected cells to the drugs. Now, if we look at the um, heterogeneous response, the primary cause is because of the stochastic transcriptional um, activity. Uh, so here you can see the transcription site in uh, HeLa cells, uh, 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 the intensity fluctuating intermittently. Um, now if we look closer into the transcription machinery, the polymerase transcribes a few nucleotides and then it's paused because of the presence of a nucleosome downstream. And here on, it waits for other factors that it needs to remove this blockage and uh, continue elongating efficiently. Now, all these processes that I mentioned have de distinct time scales in which they function, which can range from a few seconds to a few minutes, even hours and days. And um, these molecular processes uh, result in a change of state of the, uh, the HIV promoter. For example, it can change from off or inaccessible, which is a compact chromatin, or on or more accessible so that the polymerase can come and bind to it. And random transitions between these states result in what we see as a heterogeneous gene expression. Now, um, some people introduce transcriptional noise, and I would like to elabor elaborate further on it. Uh, there are two, um, transcriptional noise can be decomposed into intrinsic or extrinsic depending on its source. So imagine two identical genes in the same cell. They could show correlated expression, but if you look at the individual events of the polymerase, they would be uncorrelated. This would be because of the inherent um, intrinsic properties of each gene promoter. So in case of HIV, this is of immense relevance because we want to understand 
um, whether the reactivation, the viral reactivation has uh, uh, its sources more relating to the viral promoter itself or it's something more uh, related to the, uh, more, it's cell specific basically. Um, so the current methods to measure transcriptional noise, one of the most popular ones is Spino Factor, uh, but it cannot, it's not sufficient to interpret um, the sources of noise. Uh, the second one is based on uh, decomposition of variants, uh, which was proposed by Elowitz a long time ago, which basically says if um, two, the, the expression of two genes is correlated or more along the diagonal, the more extrinsic um, effects there, there are. Um, so now we have four-dimensional data because uh, uh, of the advances in live cell imaging. So we need to think of new strategies so that we can incorporate these information as well in our um, analysis of the transcriptional model. So um, uh, Hussein, who's, my, who's a fellow PhD student, uh, designed this two-copy reporter in HeLa cells. Um, wherein we control the site of integration uh, using a homology arm and we have MS2 systems which are a popular way of visualizing transcription. Um, so as a preliminary um, experiment, we performed some fixed cell um, SM fish uh, and we tried to measure or estimate the amount of uh, extrinsic noise there would be in the system. And each time we would do it, even though we could see with our eyes that they show correlated activity, the measured extrinsic noise was very low. Unless we included the basal data as well. So what in fact we were seeing is something called the Simpsons paradox, wherein group data show certain behavior, uh, um, which seems to disappear when we ungroup it. So what I want to stress is we need temporal data in order to study extrinsic noise and the promoter activity of HIV. So and, uh, luckily, um, the system we designed uh, helps us to do exactly that. So these are our um, homozygous CRISPR cell lines. And you can see um, the two transcription sites from the two reporters activating in a correlated way when we stimulate it with drugs. Uh, in this case, it was TNF-alpha, which is known to uh, activate a certain um, signaling pathway. Um, so it's my job uh, to analyze hundreds and tons of movies um, using um, spot detection and tracking algorithms. So in the end, I'm able to have these kind of uh, traces of the transcription site activity, and I can quantify the number of mRNA in each transcription site. <clears throat> so once I have these traces, I plan to use the autocorrelation approach, which again has been introduced already. So autocorrelation is how similar two, seg two signals are over time. Um, and if you have several nuclei and two transcription sites in each nuclei, there are three ways of pairing them. You can take two transcription sites in the same cell or pair two different transcription sites in different cells, or you can take the autocorrelation of, um, of a transcription site. And each of these uh, functions show, uh, are significantly different from the other. Uh, if you look here, so the cross covariance of unpaired transcription sites, so taken from different cells, if the cells are uh, not in the same environment, would flatten out as you can see in the, in the function number two. And um, the cross covariance of uh, two spots from the same cell are different from the autocovariance as well. And uh, from the cross covariance, actually, it's possible to extract information about the extrinsic effects that the two copies uh, had undergone. And um, what about the intrinsic effects? That can be extracted from by taking the difference of function three and one, which is the autocovariance and cross-covariance. So you have 
you can extract both intrinsic and extrinsic properties of the promoter. So I will, uh, today I will show you a validation of this theoretical concept, which I did using simulated data. So to um, model both intrinsic and extrinsic noise, I use a two-state uh, allele system. And these two alleles are embedded in an environment such that any changes in the environment affects the internal machinery of each allele. So in this case, uh, by changing the activation rate each time the environment changes. And um, using a piecewise deterministic Markov process, which is PDMP, uh, we were able to extract the extrinsic time scales of the environmental switches as well. So in this case, it's a Markov switch and the rates are F and H. So I will not go into too much detail on the math because some of you don't like it. Um, so here is an example of the simulation and the data fit. Um, and you can see it corresponds well with the theoretical um, estimates. And uh, from the fit, I was able to extract the time scales of the switch. Uh, and in the case of a Markov's environment, uh, the shape of the cross covariance turns out to be a sum of exponentials, uh, and the powers give us the different rates that we are concerned in, uh, about. And uh, what about autocorrelation approach on real data? Well, that's coming soon because uh, it takes a lot of time to analyze the real data. Uh, and, uh, to conclude, um, uh, we managed to make an in vivo approach to measure the uh, intrinsic and extrinsic properties of HIV. Um, and uh, hopefully this will help us to bring new insights into the stochastic reactivation of uh, infected HIV cells. And that's all. Um, next up is Ricardo Rabasio. Thank you. Wait, what? What did you do? We can also. So I'm Ricardo, I'm a postdoc with Arvin Murugan at UChicago, and today uh, I will tell you about a work that um, we just actually put on the archive. And the title is A Minimal Scenario for the Origin of Non-Equilibrium Order, and it can be rephrased of who let the demon out. Um, so 
I, if we think about this little story, um, you can, you know, imagine a scenario where you are in a room, and as if we are used, this room is very disordered, and this is the even before condition, and then you let time pass, and the room is disordered again, so nothing happens. But then there is a little demon that appears that is using energy and dissipating heat, and then the room starts to be ordered after that. And what we were asking is like, okay, under which condition we can have such a coupling to a non-equilibrium source that can lead to order? And of course, like this is a question that has a lot of answer and has been to, you know, taught a lot by since Schrodinger wrote What is Life? And there are several answers out there. So one possible answer, we call it the Darwinian answer, that says that order confers a fitness benefit and hence you have it. Another answer that has been um, pioneered by the work of Ilya Prigozhin and then picked up a bit by uh, Jeremy England is that it's kind of the physics answer, which is like order is just, you know, a spontaneous behavior of like highly driven matter and you get it there. And after this talk, I hope to give you a new per perspective on answering this question, which is that as a consequence of a self-replicative system, you can get order for free, even if there is no direct benefit. So what we're saying is that getting order in such a non-equilibrium coupling is not as difficult as it's been taught before. So as a first example, we thought of order in DNA replication. So you can start, you know, you have your DNA and you have your enzyme, the DNA polymerase was replicating DNA and is doing it in an orderly manner because you want to keep a transmission of variable information, so you want few errors. So you go from an order state to another order state. If you look at what, uh, how is disorder maintained, well, there, there's been theories developed by Nino and Hopfield in the 70s by, you know, the theory of kinetic proofreading, and this is just a non-equilibrium mechanism that is kind of bringing back the enzyme to the beginning state with some cycles, and is making the polymerase be able to proofread. And this is lowering uh, the error rate in the uh, blue range that you see there, so up to 10 to the minus seven um, mutation per base pair. And so this is our demon in the case of replication. And if we look at the usual theories that are uh, the theories of kinetic proofreading where you start from a network, like the one there on the left where you are on an enzyme E and you can take the path of right and wrong incorporation, and then you have these proofreading cycles and bring you back through from the origin that are those blue arrows, and you plot the time to replicate a strand of DNA versus the error rate, you get this kind of curve, which is the trade-off that says that if you're fast, you make a lot of errors. Okay, so what we did was to think a little bit more about how the enzyme, what the enzyme is doing. So this is a DNA polymerase sitting on a DNA, and what is observed experimentally is that the process is fast if the nucleotide that is incorporated before is actually the correct one. But if the nucleotide before is the wrong one, the DNA replication is, is stalled, and this is called stalling. And if we put these into the theories, we get the emergence of a new regime with this counterintuitive trade-off where you can be fast and accurate at the same time, which leads to the hypothesis that selection for speed alone can lead us to non-equilibrium proofreading mechanism and hence to order. So we defined a random copier, uh, which is, you know, just random copier, and then we evolved it in silico for um, selection for speed. So here is our fitness function that is decreasing. And then what we see is that entropy dissipation rate starts increasing, and at the same time, error decreases, which means that actually we got order non-equilibrium for free, just by selecting for the time to replicate. And so this is just the example of replication, but in the paper that is out, we also discuss the same in self-assembly, and in a more abstract model of replication where instead of uh, the stalling effect, we have the variance of distribution of replication times and we have random resets. And these are my collaborators, the funding, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, yes, but the fact is that you, so replication, yeah, it's, it's driven, it's a driven system you know, without proofreading, sure, but if you don't have proofreading cycles, you cannot achieve like higher accuracy. So in the, in the off-field case, you, so if delta is the advantage you get,
by discrimination, you never get to the upfield limit of maximal accuracy if you don't have proofreading. So if you don't have proofreading cycles, like the proofreading cycles are the non-equilibrium part and make you more accurate in a way. Like the driven process itself is not going to push you to lower accuracy. One more? Just you, yeah. Yes. Well, but so what we think is that you know stalling comes from sort of a geometric is a sort of geometric frustration that is there for the you know just the even in non idiomatic replication you you have stalling just because of you know the structure like these three principles. Yeah. And in self assembly is also there, and yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So next is Surabhi Jaiswal. So hello everyone, I'm Surabhi Jaiswal from ICER Bhopal, India. So I'm a PhD student, and here I will talk about the uh, modeling of the chemo attractive active polymer. Here we have used two different methods, the explicit solvent method and the implicit solvent method. And this work is done in collaboration with Professor Marisol Ripoll from Zurich. So here, most of the community knows about active matter systems, so I am just giving this introduction here, and I will skip this. So here, this work talks about the chemically active polymer, where we have a genus kind of active motors, which are stitched together to form a polymer. And this, in the presence of chemical activity, this polymer is making a coil to globule transition. But this work has some limitation on the uh, polymer length because of the presence of explicit solvent method. So to overcome that problem and to uh, visualize the effect of scaling for higher polymer chain length, we have introduced another method by mapping the parameters from the explicit solvent method to uh, an implicit solvent method. And in order to do the mapping, first we have taken the dimeric section, which are the active unit, units in our case, and then we tuned some parameters. So here we have explicit solvent method, which is referred to as a chai plus model. Here we have dimeric section con consisting of foretic and source bead. So source bead is giving rise to a chemical reaction, and which is sensed by the foretic particles, and it is giving rise to the activity of the dimeric section. And uh, here, uh, the uh, dimer dynamics is given by the hybrid molecular dynamics and multiparticle collision dynamics. And we have modeled the explicit solvent using the MPCD method. So next, this is the implicit solvent model, where, uh, which is referred to as the HI minus model. And the beads are, uh, the equation of uh, motion of the beads are governed by this equation, given equation. Just okay. So here we have introduced another ex, uh, external force which takes care of the chemical gradient uh, shown by the explicit solvent method, which is given by FC and alpha C and grad C are the parameters which are mapping from uh, which are getting mapped from the explicit solvent to implicit solvent method. So here we have the results for the dimeric section. We calculated the concentration graded from explicit solvent method, and then we tuned the parameter as alpha C. And then for particular alpha C, we are getting a velocity here, a matching of the velocity from both the two methods. And then we also tuned the size of the particle in order to have the same characteristics as shown by the explicit solvent method. So here we have tuned the rotational diffusion constant of the particle. And then we tune the Peclet number, so which is given by the v uh, ratio of uh, the velocity to the rotational diffusion constant. And then we have got a size ratio, which is like perfect to match from uh, explicit to implicit solvent matter. So this section is then, uh, like these dimeric sections are applied to uh, form a polymer chain. And uh, so here we calculated the structural properties in terms of radius of gyration. So HI plus method is showing some higher value than the HI minus method. And in, to incorporate that uh, feature, we have included another method, which is repulsive foretic ground in dynamics. And it is showing to match the HI plus model. So these two methods are like 
H i plus and H i minus R. So here we are seeing that H i minus has the uh, uh, promising model. It is the promising model to mimic the structural properties, which is given by the explicit solvent method. So next we have done the scaling of R g with respect to N. So all the three models are showing the passive scaling as 0.61. And uh, for the uh, for the passive case and for active case, we are getting a scale, globular scaling as 0.33 for shorter chain lengths, which is approaching towards 0.33 for increasing the size of the polymer. So here, this non-monotonous behavior in RG is coming due to the competition between the attractive active force and the entropy of the system. So here, I will conclude my talk that we have introduced the hydrodynamic effect for implicit solvent method. And this method can be implemented to model the uh, longer polymer chains. And the interplay of attractive active force and the entropy is causing the non-monotonous behavior in structures. So this work is under review. Now I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, my collaborator, and the lab group and the funding agency. Thank you. Be one question. Um, if not, next talk is Johannes Kaiser. Oh, question in the back. Sorry, one question in the back. Can you repeat, please? What? Okay, can you repeat once more? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So it may come like after, uh, so we are able to get the scaling till like chain length as uh, 600. So maybe if we get some higher polymer chain, it will uh, like may get some saturation there. So we have not explored that uh, longer chain length. We have gone till 600 as the polymer chain length. So it was a scaling at that point. Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Johannes Kaisers and I'm a, f a second year PhD student now in the team of Luca Chandrini um, and currently in Montpellier at the CBS. And today I'm going to talk about mRNA degradation as a rescue mechanism for bacterial growth. So when I talk about bacterial growth, I mean that all my, um, uh, that my cells are growing exponentially, so all my cells grow with the same rate lambda. We're then interested in how this um, growth rate actually changes for different antibiotic concentration, and we typically then look at IC50 values. IC50 value is simply the antibiotic concentration at which your original growth rate is um, one half its original. But we are mostly interested in translation um, limiting antibiotics, and for this we use a um, translation model called the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process, which has been developed in the 1970s exactly for this model, where particles can enter with the rate alpha, hop along with the rate um, epsilon, and then finally terminate with the rate beta. Um, in general, we are uh, interested in the two observables, so one we have the density and the other one is the current where the current is basically equivalent to the protein production of the, of the mRNA. As I mentioned earlier, we, we use a different type of, a diff, a somewhat different flavor of the TASEP, where particles can actually enter a pause state, which then symbolizes the antibiotic bound state, and then they unpause with a certain rate K minus, which are intrinsic to the antibiotic. Here it's chloramphenicol. To give you a little bit of an idea about the time scales, so chloramphenicol roughly has an unbinding time of 12 minutes, and I think most of us in the room know that the mRNA lifetime is typically much shorter than this. So the um, degradation has to be um, considered here. We're not really interested in, in, a, in a one mRNA system, so what we actually want to simulate or want to, want to know is how our mRNA pool competes for ribosomes. So they are you know, linked, all the mRNAs are linked through the free ribosome pool, and can't go into the details, but we are able to, to simulate this. 
and then we know how much current um, our system produces per mRNA and how many mRNAs we have. Because it's an exponential growth, everything grows with lambda p. We can solve for lambda, and now we have a, a measurement for the growth rate, which we can change with antibiotic concentration. If we then look at what happens for different mRNA lifetimes, we see that for um, if I increase or if I decrease my mRNA lifetime, my IC50 value goes up. The opposite is also true. If I um, increase the lifetime, my uh, IC50 value increases. And then in the simulation, you can have very stable mRNAs, and so that means your cell dies very quickly. If you compare this with experimental data, you can see that it fits, or you can um, fit it reasonably well. So the big kind of the prediction here is that high mRNA lifetime leads to higher susceptibility against um, translation inhibiting antibiotics. So we thought, okay, this is pretty easy to test. So we looked at different mutants that have uh, missing degradation proteins. So they are single, uh, single knockout mutants, and then we measured simply the IC50 curves. And this is uh, very preliminary, but this is the first one, and we see that the RNAs2 mutant actually has a lower, uh, lower IC50 value. So conclude, our model predicts high mRNA, higher mRNA lifetime leads to higher susceptibility against translation limiting antibiotics and the preliminary experimental results kind of follow this. I want to thank everyone uh, that worked with us on this and then uh, thank you. And if you want to contact me or talk to me, please. <laughs> At the back? That is a very good question. Uh, I don't know necessarily. I think uh, um, this is just um, um, starting, but one way you could think about is if you put, like, for example, um, RNAs E. So RNAs E is an antibiotic and kind of on a plasmid, and so it could be induced. So you could um, induce the. Um, the plasmid into the cells, which makes the cell then die quicker if you lower the degradation rate. But how to actually put that into a medicine, I have no idea. Last question. Okay, then next is uh, Dimitri. Oh, works. Hi. So this is the the first time I'm at this meeting, and uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. Uh, but it feels a little bit like a race because everybody's speaking very fast. Uh, and so I decided maybe I shouldn't talk very fast. And so instead of rushing through the paper, I'm just going to try to give you a 15-minute tutorial into how one can try to start approaching this question. I'm not going to answer the question, but how to try to start approaching this question. So uh, the work was done by uh, two computer scientists from Texas and Austin, undergrad who was at UT but now is at Rice University, and uh, my close collaborators in uh, Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. So Christian is a postdoc there, and Aliash. So I like to complain about my colleagues, the theoreticians, who complain that they have a lab. That my lab, my please, my lab, that. And so, so I said that you cannot claim to have a lab unless you wear a lab coat. So somebody actually gave him a lab coat. <laughs> He's a mathematical physicist. Uh, so making coffee is the closest to any experiment. <laughs> so uh, here's the uh, picture, uh, famous picture from Ferenc work in which he tested Einstein theory of Brownian motion by watching Brownian particles under the microscope. Um, but about a hundred years ago, before that, Robert Brown, who saw this, uh, he asked the question, is it dead or alive? Right? So because that, those particles came from some plants or whatnot, uh, and so maybe, maybe it's alive, that's why it's moving around. So the question is, do we have an answer or advice for uh, Dr. Brown? 
It's a very hard question. So he actually solved this problem by saying, look, what if I just replace it by some matter that I know is definitely dead? So he took some other particles and put them under on the microscope and he saw the same thing, and then he concluded it's not alive. But the question is, can we actually answer this question by simply looking at the trajectory? And so the key point here is that uh, as you zoom in more and more microscopically, things look more and more reversible or close to equilibrium in a sense, because you can hope you can see that I'm alive. Uh, however, if you measure the velocity distribution of water molecules in my body and in that uh, bottle of water, it's going to be exactly the same except for a different temperature. So by looking at molecules, you can't tell if it's dead or alive. So, the, so it's actually hard even for Brownian particles, but my main interest is single molecules. And so in some cases, you can really tell if it's dead or alive. So this is a, a picture of a molecular motor that walks along the track. And you see it's going in one direction. So, so that's good. That, that works. On the other hand, if you do other kinds of experiments, for example, this is a, you could have enzyme that does some turnover, but you have a signal look like, that looks like this, for example, right? So there's no directional motion. Or even worse, you can do a fluorescence experiment in which you just get a stream of photons out of the molecule. And so that's the kind of question that I want to ask. Can we, first of all, tell if it's dead or alive? And second of all, can we actually quantify whether it's reversible or not. So, well, here's the answer in principle. So physically, the answer is, and it's a boring answer because my car is alive according to this answer. So uh, my, we produce heat, and this is heat capture. We calculate the end production, which is just the heat of the uh, release divided by temperature, and that's the answer. Uh, unfortunately, that's very hard to measure at a single molecule level. So there is an alternative information theoretical answer. And the answer is basically if I take some time series and, and you, you know, take a piece of that time series and time reverse that and see does it fit within my signal. So in other words, uh, is the forward trajectory statistically equivalent to the backward trajectory? And the sort of the, the mathematical measure of that is just the relative entropy of the direct time series and the reverse time series, you can compute that. And quite remarkably, when you get that, that's going to give you the entropy product. Now, um, many systems, or in fact almost all systems, in some sense, that we study in Molecular systems and biological systems can be described as some kind of random walk on some complicated graph. Right? So if that's the case, and so the key property here is that this is a Markov process. Markov means that there's no memory. So the probability of this step only depends on where I am at this point. And if you have this property, then you can easily write down the expression just before, but now you realize that all, all you need to do is include the correlation between the subsequent layers. So in other words, you, you say you go from I to J, I only need to look at pairs of jumps, or pairs of sites, just, just single jumps. That's all I need to know. So if I simply calculate the probability that I have I and then I have J, and if I have probability that I have J and then I have I, that's all I need, and then you can stick it to this formula and you're done. Now, I want to illustrate it using a, a very difficult, a di a different system. So this is a Shannon's model of the English language. I'm doing this because, first of all, because it's fun, but second of all, because actually the tools that we use come, basically come from Shannon. So you can think about, ask the question, is encyclopedia the language of language? Is it statistical? Is it? Now, we know that it's not the case, but if it's not your native language, maybe it's a complicated question. So you can uh, think about Encyclopedia Britannica as a random walk in which your or signal, or whatever it is, is just a letter, and time is just a position in the text. And so Shannon basically proposed, let's say, we have a random walk like this, and suppose that next letter only depends on the previous letter, and then again you can calculate the central production. But you can even don't you don't have to do that. Instead of that, you can just say, look, uh, 
uh, let's calculate the number of times I see some d followed by n and n followed by d. And if you just simply count that, you can find out it's a different number. And that means that the time reverse that I'm going to change the frequency of time reverse. But now, of course, Shannon was not the first one to propose this model of language. The first random walk model of language was Russian language by a Russian mathematician, What he did here was on a mission to prove that free will does not exist. And in that effort, he uh, performed a statistical analysis of famous Russian poem, uh, Evgeny Onegin. Uh, but because his computational resources were very limited, he used a coarse grain model. So he coarse grain the state space into two eras, vowels and consonants. So this is the Markov model of Russian language. It just consists of two states and can go between the two, or you can just have self transition, which will go from one consonant to another consonant. So basically, this is what the Russian poem looks like in the Markov. And you can easily compute this well, for any C to V transition between the other V to C. So the frequency of V C pairs for this case is going to be exactly the same as C to V pair. And that means that this sequence is completely reversible. Well, the answer no. Because Marcus Lava and Marcus. <laughs> It turns out that when you did this coarse graining, you created very, well, it's actually not Markov to begin with, as Shannon described. But even if you pretend that in your language is a Markov model, once you coarse grain to two letters, you become very, very non Markov. And once you take that into account, actually, you can find out that the English language or the Russian language is still time irreversible. OK, now that's. Uh, good news and that's a bad news. The bad news because, for example, this number two is very, very terrible. It's very, very inconvenient for us. So, um, <coughs> unfortunately, people who use, for example, fluorescence, they use just two colors of photons. Well, sometimes you can have more, but more is very difficult. So we have two colors. That's, that's complicated. And in general, this is what happens. So imagine that you have a three-state system that has a cycle. So it, overall, it rotates. But as soon as you suppose that you cannot distinguish between two and three, you project, you see something like that. And that looks like non-Markov Markov model. So now you go A, B, and B, and B. It's not impossible, but it's hard. It becomes a difficult problem. And so basically this non-Markov uh, phenomenon is, is, is really the bane of this whole field. This is something that we have to deal with. And uh, basically non-Markov effects of memory come from the fact that we coarse grade dynamics, or lambda dynamics, or in other words, we project something. We cannot differentiate between different states. Uh, and it turns out that the simplest source of non markov effects is simply experimental measurement. So as soon as I, I cannot measure all the details of my process, right? So I, for example, I have one That means that that immediately gives me non markov Sometimes just having finite exper uh, spatial resolution gives you memory. Uh, and it um, turns out that this, because now I have to consider very long sequences, not just limited to two, my sequence becomes very long, that results in a very high computational challenge. And in the remaining, I don't know, two minutes that I have, I'm just going to give you one idea that comes from this work that we just published. Uh, and so it turns out that sometimes you're better off Sometimes you, if you discard some details of the process that you see, you are better off. And I'm just going to illustrate it the following way. So suppose that I simply drive in a Brownian particle with a force. And I'm going to measure the location of the particle with a finite spatial resolution. And the way I'm, I'm just going to pretend that this is how I do the experiment. I'm just going to pin, so this is my coordinate of the particle. Uh, and I'm just going to bin it in little bins. And suppose that I can only, I only know what bin the particle is. So I only know that it's here. I don't know exactly where it is because I don't have the bins. I have these little bins. And so now I want to coarse grain the dynamics of the particle into this discrete process in which all I know is the location of a bin. And it turns out 
Now, this is a trivial example. I know exactly how much heat I'm producing. This is just a force times the mean velocity divided by the temperature. But it turns out, if I simply naively coarse grain it by simply binning that, I get something like this. I And the reason is uh, very simple. So here's the reason. Um, so this is the original trajectory, the black one, right? So this is, it's, now uh, remember, Brownian motion is very pathological. It's very, now when I bin that, you get the green line. And you can see exactly what's happening. So you see that I jump between the two. Brownian motion, if I have a boundary, if I cross it once, I'm going to cross it a lot of times if I have a very rapid recrossing of this boundary between the pins, and that gives you a highly non-marked process. So what do you do? And what it turns out you can do is uh, use the process that we call, that's a post-processing of the data. So I can take the green line and post-process it by milestone. Milestoning basically gives you the red line, which eliminates the crossing. So the idea is very simple. So if I, for example, I cross this line, so this is my pin, I cross it once. Once I did that, these recrossings get ignored, so my state does not change. Then I cross the next milestone, and then again, I only when I cross the next milestone do I actually. So that's the idea. Uh, so nothing, I'm using the same, I'm throwing away information. It does not require anything new. I'm just completely ignoring some details of the motion. But it turns out when you do that, you discover the exact result. Of course, in this case, this is a trivial example because you have a Brownian particle, which is completely marked. So, well, I better get the result. But it turns out that it works quite well, even for systems where, first of all, you don't know immediately what the answer is. Where your original dynamics is hard One more question, maybe? Thank you. 
going to give me the exact answer. That old is almost like the truth. In some cases, it can feed. Imagine like a molecule that emits photons. I model the hidden marker, and my hidden marker is true. Then, even if the photons are very, very sparse, so I know nothing that happens in between. Hidden marker is going to give me the exact answer. That's sort of the. However, that. Um, next up, then, is Emma Dawson. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the cooperative expansion dynamics of swarming bacterial colonies. So... There we go. For... Bacteria that are stuck on a surface, uh, they're really limited by sort of their footprint, right? For how much space they can take up and how much nutrients they can take in to make more bacteria, more biomass. Um, and so the ability to move across that surface unlocks a whole world of new nutrients and space for those bacteria. Um, and that can be really helpful for them um, to be able to create more bacteria, right? More successful. Um, so bacteria that can move across the surfaces get a whole bunch of benefits, but it's hard to do. Uh, so one strategy that bacteria use uh, to move over a surface is called swarming. Um, and swarming is cooperative. So you can see all these bacterial cells here. They're all motile, but the individual ones are stuck because they need to work together with a group of other bacteria um, and once they're in sort of a group of sufficient density, they're able to move. Um, and this particular bacteria is Proteus mirabilis, um, and it's very good at this kind of cooperative swarming. Now, in addition to being very good at this uh, cooperative swarming, there is something interesting about Proteus mirabilis that has been sort of puzzling people for about 100 years, uh, which is that they create these bullseye patterns through a cycle of phenotypic uh, switching. So when you stick them on a surface, uh, they start out vegetative, they can't move, uh, and they will differentiate into these elongated, hyperflagellated swarmer cells. Those cells can move together to expand the colony, and then they will stop, de-differentiate, grow for a bit, and then start again. So each of those phenotypic cycles drives one of these rings being formed in the colony. Um, and they're not doing this with cellular clocks. They're not doing it with chemotaxis. We're not sure uh, sort of how they do it. Um, and we're also not really sure why they do it. So if we look at the expansion of these colonies, right, more space is more biomass for these bacteria. Um, and once they hit this differentiation and they're swarming, they're expanding and gaining more space, right? Why do they stop, right? Back into these vegetative cells, no expansion. They grow, and then they'll start swarming again. And most bacteria that do this kind of cooperative swarming, they just turn swarming on and they keep going with it. Um, and so it's been a little bit unclear sort of why, why are they doing this stopping? And we're going to use a slightly different frame on this than uh, has typically been used. Um, here you can see uh, that cycling behavior is highly conserved, right? It's very tightly regulated, and uh, they're able to do it over a wide range of surface conditions, which to the individual bacteria uh, look all the way from this very low density on top to this high density at the bottom, right? So it's very important to them, but why are they doing it? Um, and so, in order to figure out why they're doing it, we need to ask what happens if they don't stop, right? Um, 
Potentially, they keep going at that same rate, right? That's the best case scenario. Uh, maybe they keep going, but they slow down eventually, or maybe they have to stop for some reason totally unrelated to the phenotypic switching, right? Um, but it's hard to do this with wild-type Proteus mirabilis because that phenotypic switching cycle is so uh, tightly regulated, so important to them. And so we're gonna use this mutant. This is a precocious swarming mutant. Um, which is missing a bunch of key regulation for swarming. Um, so it's not regulating uh, a pause before it starts swarming on a surface. Um, most importantly, it does not have those consolidation periods. So it turns on swarming and doesn't stop. Um, and it also uh, is not controlling the fraction of cells that differentiate which wild type is, which lets us get um, different densities of particular swarming cells than we can with wild type. Um, and so this makes it a helpful model system for us to understand the underlying physics dynamics of that cooperative swarming for wild type. Um, and when you compare the expansion of these uh, mutant colonies, you'll see while the wild type does the cycling of expansion and consolidation, um, these pret colonies initiate swarming and then they continue swarming. And when we start them off the same, the pret colonies start swarming earlier, but their expansion rate ends up being significantly slower than that of wild type over time. Now, we get a couple of pieces of really important information from these uh, prec swarming colonies. So the first thing we see is that these prec swarming colonies show two phases of expansion in the absence of that phenotypic cycling. So we have this initial fast expansion, and how fast they go during that fast expansion depends on the density that we start them at. So in addition to needing a minimum density to be able to move, we have a pretty wide range of density where increasing density actually increases speed. This is extra cooperative. Um, and the second thing we see is that all of those colonies that start out differently reach the same steady state uh, expansion eventually. Um, and so this is uh, sort of nudging us towards thinking possibly this steady state swarming um, is going to be a traveling wave. Um, so traveling wave solutions, just quickly, um, for things like expanding diffusion equations, right? A traveling wave solution is going to be uh, a set of features that is moving at a constant rate and not changing, right? So same shape moving over time not changing. And what we see when we look at the density of our PREC colonies um, is that once they're in that steady state, right, the colony continues expanding at a fixed rate, but the profile is not changing. Um, and so these PREC colonies are reaching uh, that steady state swarming in a traveling wave. And this can sort of point us to a possible benefit for cycling, right? Which is that if we look at these uh, prec colonies without cycling compared to the wild type colonies that do have cycling, um, even though the range of velocities accessible, right, to our hyperswarming colonies, right, extends much higher than the average rate of that wild type colony. You can see this red line of the average wild type speed, so including swarming and stopping, ends up being faster than the steady state swarming rate for these colonies without regulation, right? So by sort of hopping up and down uh, this uh, swarming velocity and density, right, it seems like they're able to end up with a faster average expansion um, than if they're not doing that. But biology is messy, right? We're comparing two different strains, one with regulation, one without, right? How do we know for sure that this is just the cycling behavior, right? And not something else about these two particular strains? Um, so to do that, we're gonna turn to the math. And we're gonna model the expansion of these colonies um, using a model that includes density-dependent diffusion um, and growth. So instead of a fixed diffusion rate, we've got our diffusion rate set here by a hill function. So that incorporates um, basically the minimum speed, right, to swarm, 
uh, the maximum density where we, we kind of max out our speed, um, and then that transition of speed in between. And our model colonies um, in the system reproduce that same two-phase expansion as our model prep colonies, right? And we see that expansion is, again, dependent on our initial density of the colony. Um, so higher density colonies start out faster, but they all end up at that same steady state speed. And we uh, also see that our model colonies are reaching uh, traveling wave solutions, right? Um, and so this is the sort of um, special finding for this kind of expansion, uh, density dependent diffusion. And so the next step um, for all of this is to recreate this kind of cycling behavior using our modeled colonies. So when we model cycling in this same system, are we able to recreate this faster average expansion velocity um, in our cycling colonies than in our steady state um, expansion speed? And I wanna thank uh, my PI, Mr. Kim, and our uh, collaborator, Phil, and um, Aishwarya, who's another grad student in our lab. Um, and thank you all for listening. No, it's not, um, the, the cycling behavior itself is a, is a pretty complex regulated system, right? So um, it may be the case that that is especially beneficial in these surface conditions where it's really hard to swarm, but it's not particularly beneficial in circumstances where on really soft surfaces it's much easier. Um, it might not be worth kind of maintaining all of that regulation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what we expect to see is that the benefit of swarming should depend on um, the sort of ratio of the diffusion and the growth in a particular system, and that for uh, slower diffusion systems, it should be more beneficial to be cycling than faster ones, yeah. Yeah, so um, we can uh, mix the two. Um, the thing is that wild type has got lots of regulation over the fraction of cells that it turns into swarmers. So actually only a small population of the wild type cells are swarmers. Um, and when we mix them together, we get sort of uh, cycling from that wild type um, mixed together with a bit of continuous expansion. Um, it is a several, generally going to be several division times. Um, it depends on what surface you put them on, um, but it's, it's significantly longer. Yes. So um, this, the simple answer is no. The real answer is it's a little bit complicated. Um, so traditionally, it's been understood that they're only dividing when they're in that vegetative state. Um, but what we find is that even in our precocious mutant that is generating only those swarmer cells, the population is still growing. So there is still growth and division happening in those swarmer cells, it just seems to be much slower um, than in the vegetative state. Next is Fred. 
Okay, uh, my apologies. Now the five minute talks are back, and uh, so I'll try to be as uh, clear as possible. I'm Francesco Marcolli. I'm glad to be here. I'm a first year PhD at uh, University of Genova, and today I will talk uh, about my work on multi sensor odor prediction with imperfect proprioception, and in particular, we, I try to tackle the question of how does imperfect proprioception affect odor prediction in turbulence. Okay. Okay. So first of all, a bit of background. Uh, animal can uh, use odor for uh, locate and navigate to to the source, uh, even in turbulent environment where this uh, the signal the odor signal is way more complicated. And so classical models chemotaxi are not uh, not working, cannot work. And uh, in particular, we are interested in the ca in uh, the case of octopus. Uh, indeed, our collaborator in U.S. shows that uh, uh, octopus can perform blind odor navigation. Uh, how they can uh, uh, smell the, the water um, with the suckers that they have all uh, throughout all their body. So, uh, and this uh, is uh, an advantage, but also could be uh, a problem due to the uh, morphology of the octopus. Indeed, it's uh, thought that octopus has a poor sense of proprioception. Uh, what is proprioception is the, uh, roughly, is the sense uh, that informs the organism about the configuration uh, of the organi organism itself in the space. And uh, so we are, uh, our goal is to infer the relative position between uh, the other source, uh, in that case, oh, sorry, I will, I, okay, sorry. Okay. The other source, uh, the relative um, distance between the other source and the agent, uh, using uh, other measured by many sensors. Uh, so uh, we, have, we try to um, break the symmetry of the other plume using uh, different uh, sensors in a different uh, uh, point in space. And we want to understand how this uh, imperfect uh, knowledge about the relative position of, uh, of the sensor can affect our, the precision of the of the, of the predictions. I developed from scratch a very simple model to try to extract the main features of uh, this, uh, this problem. Uh, as you can see, in, uh, we have the, this circle that represents the, the perceived size of, the, of the, uh, the agent. The blue dots are the perceived positions of the sensor that can uh, perform uh, uh, the, the odor measurement, and the purple one is the, is the real position uh, of, the, of the sensor. As you can see, uh, the real position, uh, the, the real size of the sensor within this, uh, this approach could, be, could exceed the, the perceived size. Uh, you can, show, uh, can see some uh, mathematical modeling, uh, and uh, in particular, I define this, uh, this likelihood where the first term contains this physics, so basically it's the probability to detect uh, uh, the odor in a certain point, and the second, uh, the second term it contains the proprioceptive error, so it's basically the um, probability distribution of, uh, of the error inside that, uh, the, the yellow area. Uh, we can uh, um, divide three cases, perfect perception, where is, there's no error, imperfect perception aware, and in, that, in this case, uh, the, the agent use, uh, this, uses this uh, integral to restore the positional information, and uh, the imperfect perception unaware, where uh, is unaware of, of the error, it do not, uh, doesn't try to restore positional information. Uh, um, we ignore for now the probabilistic approach that I use. It's very simple. If someone has some answer, uh, a question can, uh, can ask, but uh, quickly we can show the result. Uh, the, in this first plot, uh, on the x-axis, I have the frequ frequency of uh, sampling, uh, the, the inverse of the frequency of sampling. On the uh, y, the average error or, or of the x-coordinate, and uh, each color represents a different size of, uh, of, the, uh, of the agent, uh, as you can see also in the, in the, in the picture. Uh, here for, uh, for, um, is the case of perfect proprioception. So there's no error, and uh, we can see that uh, at uh, very, very high frequency of sampling and for small radius, the, um, the prediction not uh, very good, but it, uh, this increase with, uh, um, with the increase in the waiting, the waiting time and uh, the, uh, the, the size, uh, increasing the size. Uh, 
in the case uh, of uh, unaware, so where this, there, uh, we have error, but uh, we, um, we, does, we do not try to restore the position information, we have that for big radius, the, uh, the green line is a detrimental. So we have a very, very uh, big error because in my model, the errors depend on, on, the, on the radius. But for small radio and for high frequency, uh, maybe contributively, we see that uh, the predictions are uh, better even in the case of uh, perfect perception, suggesting that uh, uh, having a statistically bigger size is uh, better to, uh, have, um, to have a pre precise position information about the sensor. The last case is when uh, I try to restore the position information, I can uh, extract the best of the two uh, previous scenarios. Indeed, uh, even, uh, for any size of the, of the, of the system at, and for every frequency, I can perform, I can still perform uh, very good. Uh, for, and this is only for the S coordinate, but also for the, for the Y, it's uh, similar. And in conclusion, uh, a, what, what we are showing is that the, there is a trade-off between speed accuracy and, in particular, uh, poor perception helps when time is offensive. Basically, because uh, when uh, the frequency is very high, so the waiting time is uh, is, um, is low, uh, having a, a bigger size with uh, perfect knowledge about the relative position of the sensor can help uh, in uh, in, uh, in having a good oh. prediction of the of the source location. Thank you for listening. Uh, sorry, yeah. Okay, sorry. So uh, the quality is better than the In the yes, because uh, um, okay. Uh, still, we have to, uh, to uh, produce more st statistics. Uh, we have to, to but uh, the. Um, uh, I have other results that I didn't uh, it have a plus here, but uh, uh, in the case of aware, when uh, we uh, try to restore the prediction, uh, we are um, seem to, to have a, a sweet spot of uh, of, uh, of the of the size because since uh, I I modeling the error depending of the uh, on the radius, so it is a, a strong assumption. So uh, within this model. Uh, the, uh, it de depends a lot also with, um, between the ratio of the, the plume and the other plume, so the, and the, the size of the agent. So in the case of awareness, where there's an error, I statistically increase, increase the size. So when I in increase too much the size, uh, the real position will uh, end up in the white area. So basically, it's only zero. So uh, like the 40, as you can see, is a pretty good scale, the, the, the plot. So if I increase more this, this, uh, um, this size, I'm getting user information. So is, in that case, it's, it's better to have a big size, even statistically bigger than the, the perfect case when I have too, too little, but not so much bigger than when, that otherwise I, I will take useless information about the, the, the plume. Um, then our last speaker is Purushottam Dixit. used to this one okay uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, I'm gonna talk about a recent work from a couple of my students on understanding how cellular states affect cells ability to sense their environment uh, just uh, before I start this was work done by Andrew Getz who's still a PhD student in my lab and Hodakl who's now working uh, in a biotech in Boston uh, so yeah, this is uh, published recently, and the the even if you don't get anything from the top, just try to remember that when you're thinking of uh, kind of cells sensing ability, it depends from cell to cell, and it's extremely variable across the cell population. Uh, so I don't have to tell a crowd here that if you perturb, let's say, mammalian cells uh, with some extracellular environmental input. In this case, I'm showing a cartoon of a growth factor pathway. I'm going to talk about the insulin-like growth factor pathway, 
where you add a ligand in the environment uh, and you're looking at some output, let's say some transcription factor going in and out of the nucleus, uh, typically uh, if you look at a bunch of cells, you'll see uh, a response distribution uh, that's extremely variable. So here is just a movie uh, showing that exact experiment. You add IGF at time t equal to zero, you're gonna see a bright blob at the center and that's gonna diffuse out into the cytoplasm. Uh, so basically what happens in this signaling network is that when things get phosphorylated after adding the ligand, uh, the transcription factor is pulled out of the nucleus, right? So all you need to know, let's say if you add more uh, stimulus in the environment, you have less of the output in the nucleus. Uh, this is basically looking at uh, the nuclear transcription factor levels at steady state uh, following different ligand concentrations. And you can see that as, as expected, as you add more and more ligand, there's less and less of the transcription factor, but there's a huge overlap across different ligand concentrations, right? And so it may appear that cells actually don't know what ligand concentration is present in the environment because there's uh, uh, cells that are experiencing, let's say, 25 picomolar, uh, there are some cells similar to that, let's say, even at zero picomolar. And this intuition can be uh, quantified. Uh, this was done by one of my colleagues almost uh, 15 years ago now. Uh, you can think about the mutual information between the input and the output. All you have to do is this measure this experimental uh, response distribution, what is the probability of observing an output given an input, and then you can compute a mutual information uh, for a given input distribution. And the maximum of that, typically called a channel capacity, uh, I'm just gonna use a different term, sensing fidelity, which basically tells you how much information does the output have about uh, the input. And similar to uh, the, the data that I showed, uh, this experiment has been, this calculation has been done for many, many signaling pathways, uh, and the information uh, turns out to be typically quite low, right? So uh, it turns out that signaling networks have of the order of one bit of information about the extracellular input. And what this means is that one bit of information is basically two choices. So the, the cells, so sort of a poor man's way of saying this would be that the cells know whether the ligand is present or not. They don't really know the concentration of the ligand. And so if I kind of do that calculation for our pathway as well, uh, you'll get something of the order of one bit here too. And this is just a fancy way of saying that there's a lot of overlap in these distributions. Now, we have to remember that this is a single number quoted for all cells in a population, but we now also know that cells, at least mammalian cells, are inherently different from each other, and those differences are quite stable over time. Right? So if cells are heterogeneous, then one can wonder whether their sensing abilities are also heterogeneous, and instead of quoting a single number for an entire population, should I be looking at a distribution of sensing abilities over uh, a, a population of cells? Right, so indeed, heterogeneity in cell states is quite important for mammalian cells. Uh, you can think of trying to kill cells uh, with chemotherapeutic drugs. Uh, some cells die, some cells don't, and they seem to be predestined to do this. This has also been shown uh, uh, by one of my colleagues uh, at Yale uh, in bacterial cells, uh, where their ability to sense their chemotactic environment uh, is also cell dependent and quite stable for a particular cell. So you can ask a question, uh, or you can hypothesize that the sensing fidelity itself uh, is a functional phenotype of a cell, and I should expect it to vary from cell to cell. And if that's the case, then I'm also interested in understanding what is the biochemistry that will make some cells better sensors than others. Right? And the answers could be, let's say, cells that have higher receptor count or lower degradation rates or whatever. And I want a way to figure out, A, what are the differences in sensing ability between cells, and B, what biochemistry uh, results in those differences. Uh, so if we take a step back, uh, and actually the first talk in this session already introduced this concept, uh, the observed response variation is actually an average over uh, different cell states, and you can think of this as extrinsic variation. So I can write down the response distribution as a response distribution at a single cell level and then averaged over multiple cells. But I've introduced kind of unobserved parameters, theta, which are cell state variables, and th these could be, let's say, various protein constants, protein abundances, or effective rate constants in any signaling network that you're thinking about. Uh, and the, the, the response distribution at a single cell level now depends on what the parameters of the cells are. Uh, this is something that you may not be able to measure unless you have live cell imaging. Uh, but if you have a cartoon of this sort, you can at least simulate it on a computer. Uh, 
the, the final component of this picture is the distribution over cell states themselves, and this is definitely not measurable because it's a high dimensional distribution. Uh, in experiments, you may be able to measure distribution over a couple of quantities, but not a joint distribution over like 20 parameters of a model. But we have ways of inferring that from this kind of a data. It turns out to be a maximum entropy inference problem, but I'm not gonna go into that uh, right now. Just let's just take my word for it that if I have given, if you, if you give me this data and this model, I can get you a distribution of the parameters. Now once you have these three ingredients, I can uh, think about uh, how to define uh, cell-specific uh, mutual information or signaling fidelity. Uh, so let's look at what we typically do. You take a bunch of cells, they have their individual cell parameters, but you are kind of agnostic to them. You uh, give them some inputs, you look at the response distribution, those are quite overlapping. Uh, you compute a mutual information that's agnostic to the states of the cells. I can do a thought experiment where I'm doing the same experiment, but now at, at the level of single cells. Again, something that can be done on a computer uh, always, but, and sometimes can be done experimentally. And I, I can get a response distribution at the single cell level, and I can compute uh, a mutual information at the single cell level, and once I know the distribution over these parameters, I can get a distribution over uh, single cell uh, signaling fidelities. Right, so uh, that's what we did for this IGF pathway. Uh, we had the model, which we could simulate. Uh, from the experimental data, we could infer a distribution over the parameters of the model. You sample various parameters, you compute the mutual information, and you get some prediction at this uh, from a computer model. Right? So this is my computational prediction. One thing to note here is that if you look at the x-axis, is the mutual information at the single cell level. Uh, uh, those numbers are significantly higher than what you get at the population level. And in fact, almost all cells are better than this average, and this is basically Jensen's inequality. Right? It's not the case that this mean has to lie inside this distribution. And so that was my prediction. It looks like all cells are e extremely good. They actually lie very close to this upper, upper limit of two bits, and that's because the experiment had four states, so that you can't really detect anything more than four uh, inputs. And so I wanted to see whether this actually is, this prediction holds with experimental data as well. Now, if you have live cell imaging, and if you're looking at steady state distributions, you can do something like, you take a cell, you give it a ligand, you look at the steady state response, you, for the same cell, you give it extra ligand, you keep on giving extra ligands. And assuming nothing weird happens with the cells, you can approximately construct a, a single cell distribution across multiple inputs for a single cell. Right, and we could do this across multiple cells, and now from that, we can compute mutual information at the single cell level, and you can get a distribution. So this is what the model had predicted, and this is what the experimental data looks like. Uh, reasonable agreement uh, with experiments, and uh, the, the key agreement is that uh, all experimental cells are also much better than this average cell. And then you can ask, there are some cells that are not doing that well, and other cells are extremely better. You can ask, what is the biochemistry that, that leads to better sensors as opposed to worse sensors? Uh, to do that in the model, we can basically compute a joint distribution between a, whatever parameter of interest you have and uh, the, the signaling fidelity of a cell. So here is an example. Uh, the total nuclear uh, amount of this uh, transcription factor, uh, one can expect that higher the nuclear amount, lower the Poisson noise, better the sensing ability. Turns out that that's not the case. Here, each dot is a single cell, uh, and the, the red line is a trend line in the experimental data and the blue line is a trend line in the computational prediction. Uh, it turns out that other biochemical parameters, like the response range, uh, is indeed predictive of the sensing fidelity. Cells that can remove a lot of transcription factor from the nucleus are better sensors compared to cells that cannot remove enough transcription factor from the nucleus. Uh, so to kind of conclude, uh, even though there may be a lot of overlap in response distributions at the population level, it turns out, at least uh, for, for a couple of systems that we have looked at, that since the, the sensing fidelity of individual cells can be very different from each other, and most cells are actually typically much better than what the population average response will tell you. And with that, I would like to take any questions.
Uh, yes, they, so I am. I don't do experiments, so I cannot do that. But I have tried to do it on a computer. So basically, in a nutshell, what is happening is that the intrinsic noise is extremely small, and the extrinsic noise is very high. So you can push the states till the time where the intrinsic noise starts overlapping with each other. But that's and. Looking back, I didn't even have to do this calculation. So the number of receptors here is 10,000 on the cell surface. That basically means that, that that distribution is entirely because of extrinsic noise. Right? So that already gives you a rough answer as to how many states you can, you can kind of. Uh, uh, to, well, I, I wouldn't be, I won't have a number right now, but it would be definitely of the order of 20, 30, I think. Uh, I, I think that's an excellent question. I think this allows different modes of collective sensitivity. Uh, uh, in that, like, if you look at, let's say, retinal cells, which is not my field, but the different cells are do, doing deterministic computations, which are different from each other. And that allows, so, sorry, let me rephrase. If you put these cells in space, then they will be able to detect more patterns than cells that didn't that were uh, only stochastic. So these cells would be better at collective sensing, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, okay. Thank you. So now we have coffee break and then we come back at four, I think. <laughs>